I'm from the National Employment Savings Trust. Um, just a very bit of brief background um, about myself. So, so I've been working at Nest since 2008, so I've been involved in all of the creation of um, the investment strategy and the kind of fund choice architecture. Um, prior to working at Nest, I used to work at the European Commission um, as part of um, the DG that looked at kind of pension systems uh, around Europe. So I'm fairly familiar with lots of different systems, both um, in, in Europe, but, but also um, kind of wider afield. And I think it's really, really important to consider the context um, of national um, experiences. It's impossible to just transplant one system um, from, from one country to, to another. But I do think there are lots of learnings you can take um, from, from different systems. And at Nest, um, we're, we're, a, we're a government agency <coughs> in, in part, so we don't have loads and loads of money for spending on kind of research and things. Um, so what we've done has been absolutely shameless in stealing as many ideas from around the world as possible um, and relying on the expertise um, of, uh, of people who've been very, very generous in our development. So. It's really great to be able to um, give some of that back um, um, when, we, when we get the opportunity. Um, so very quickly, um, just a bit of context about the UK. Um, so before automatic enrolment, which was this huge reform um, that started in 2012 in the UK, um, the UK used to boast about it having the best occupational pension system. Um, that was probably never true, but we used to talk <laughs> it up a lot, a lot of the time. Um, it kind of really, really started going into decline um, in the 2000s, um, very, very similar to um, the US and the Australian experience. All of the DB provision started to fall away, and you had a serious um, issue with both um, lack of provision in the occupational space, but also there were real issues with the state pension. Following automatic enrollment, um, what you're seeing, the, the new rules say that all employers have to offer a pension scheme, regardless of how big the employer is. So right down to um, people who are just employing one person, like a nanny, they have to offer a pension scheme, and they have to make a contribution to it. And we've seen this complete turnaround from where saving was becoming increasingly a minority sp sport to where it's now becoming kind of commonplace. Um, and my background way, way back was um, working um, for the UK government. Um, this has been a monumental success in terms of a, a government policy reform, and it's not often that governments get to say that, that it's kind of popular across the people um, who it's affecting, both the employers and the unions, whilst they'll have concerns about different areas, but broadly speaking, um, it, it's been very successful kind of so far, so kind of touch wood. Um, just some key statistics of where we are with, with Nest. So Nest is just one part of this automatic enrolment reform. So it's best to think of us as just like any other occupational pension scheme in the UK. We're covered by the same rules as occupational pension schemes are, are covered by. The main difference is we have a statutory duty to accept all employers. So whether the employer is kind of a single person or is some huge employer like um, McDonald's or something, we have to take them. We're a non-profit organization, and we're there to make sure the automatic enrollment reforms work. So, so far, um, and bear in mind we started in October 2012, 440, it's probably half a million, this, this figure changes kind of on a, on a daily basis. Employers are working with us. We have over 5.3 million kind of members, and that um, equates to around about 2 billion in assets under management. In just two or three years, that two billion will be 20 billion. In 10 years' time, we'll be at 100 billion. So at some point, we'll become one of the largest kind of pension schemes, um, certainly in the UK, probably Europe, and one of the bigger pension schemes in the world. Um, I'm going to skip over the fund choices because, and I'll come back to them because I know this is about fund choice. Um, <laughs> but, but to my earlier point about context, very, very early on, we spent a lot of time before we started investing anybody's money, doing lots and lots of research. We did a, a significant consultation. We looked at all the international experience. We looked at a lot of the academic evidence. And it became pretty clear to us that the most important thing, um, particularly for our membership, 
which tends to be people on median incomes. We don't have as many of the kind of super rich, high net worth individuals. Then getting the default strategy right was absolutely kind of key. So what have we done in our default strategy? It's very well diversified across equities, across property, across um, various kind of fixed incomes. And um, we're just looking at the moment for um, commodity um, funds. So we're trying to get as much diversification as possible. And um, we have clear objectives and risk budgets. So our objectives are to try and outperform inflation by more than 3% um, after all charges. We want to keep costs as low as possible. So a lot of the funds that we use to invest the money tend to be index funds where we can um, get access to the market really, really cheaply. But there are some asset classes where index funds just don't make sense. So we do have active managers in the um, fixed income space. Um, and early on, we took a pretty, what we think is a pretty key decision to try and work out whether we want to insource this or rely entirely on external providers. And what we've gone is for is a hybrid. So the key decisions about asset allocation, about how we divide between equities, bonds, property, that's all done in-house. The actual running of the money, though, is done by external fund managers. So we work with some of the biggest fund managers um, in, in, in the world, so people like UBS, JP Morgan, um, Legal and General. Um, so they do their bits and they're really, really good at it and they do it very, very efficiently. But the risk management and the asset allocation is done by an in-house team and we think that's the right balance in terms of the size we are at the moment. Going forward, we may bring some more things in-house if we think we can um, do things cheaper. Um, some other key points to, to make. Um, we try and manage people's risks in different ways from when they're very young to when they're in their kind of main savings part of their career and then we change again as they get older. We use a target date fund approach. We have 50 individual target date funds, one for each year um, our membership um, can, um, can, can save. And that's where we put a lot of our focus. It's the default strategy that all the evidence suggested would be where most of our members would start off in, certainly. So that's where we think we should put the, the majority of our effort. But we do know as well that people like choice. Um, and we've heard lots from, from previous that when you ask people, do you like choice, everybody always says yes. And it's very difficult to say you're wrong about that. So we think it is important to give people choice. But to, to the early, earlier presentation, um, Professor Taylor's presentation, that the way we've approached fund choice is kind of like at the second level down from, from um, Professor Taylor's um, slide about default strategies. So we're not giving people kind of full access to the market. We're giving them very tailored, focused choices, which tries to um, kind of deal with some of the key things our research said that people were concerned about. So, for example, we have an ethical fund. Um, there's lots and lots of research out there that say people want to do good with their money. Um, what people say in surveys and what actually translates into behaviour often is very different. Um, in the UK, we've had kind of ethical funds or socially responsible funds around for 30 or 40 years. On surveys, 20, 30 percent of people would like to invest their money ethically. Ethical investment in the UK represents 1 percent of all money that's going in. So there's a huge kind of mismatch. Um, I don't think it's because people are lying in the surveys. I think people don't really realize that pensions and kind of saving for your pension involves investment at all. There's a, a complete mismatch between people's understanding of what a pension is and, uh, and investment. Um, as the previous present, uh, presenters spoke about, we do have some kind of other risk-rated kind of versions, but we were really, really careful about how we, we named them because the, the, these are supposed to be kind of dog whistles. So if you understand there's a relationship between risk and return, you'd be happy going for the higher risk fund because you know there'd be higher return. If we called it the higher return fund, we just thought everybody would pile into it saying, great, you know, higher return's good. And the same with the kind of lower growth fund. We, we gave them nasty names <laughs> to try and make people really, really think about what, what they were doing. Um, so this is the default strategy where all of our focus is in. Um, a kind of a general point about the UK, um, 
what we've seen over the last kind of 10, 15 years is a gradual decrease in the number of fund choices people are offered and how many people end up in default strategies. And in the UK, we're running at about um, kind of 80% um, is where 80% um, of all kind of money is in default strategies. And what we're seeing is a gradual decrease in the numbers of fund choices offered. And with most of the big, big funds um, that, that are around, the big occupational pensions, the numbers are around about six to 12 fund choices away from the default strategy. And I suspect that's where we'll probably end up kind of, kind of more broadly over time. In Nest, and I don't, uh, we may be a little bit different, but 99.6% of our 5.3 million members are in the default strategy. Um, so I think, I think that's a really, really kind of, and part of this is framing. Um, the legislation says you can't have automatic enrolment without having a default for people to go into for, for investments. Um, there may well be a lot of people who just don't realize that they've been put into a pension scheme. So, you know, they're, they're just not aware at all. This number may change over time. Contributions are going to start increasing over the next couple of years. But we fully expect default strategy to be over 90% um, kind of going forward. Why do we think this is? So I think like lots of you, we've looked at a lot of the research um, kind of around, around the world. Um, financial literacy is a huge issue in the UK. There was a massive campaign about 10, 12 years ago called Informed Choice in the UK, which was all about educating and informing um, you know, individuals through the workplace or through kind of one-to-one -one with the idea that people would become a lot more kind of smart and sophisticated and they would make decisions. That entire program failed completely. And what you had was people saying, oh, I know a little bit more now and there was no change in behavior. So we, we kind of went through all of that and when it was pretty clear that that wasn't working, that's where automatic enrollment kind of came from. How do we get people to save. When we ask people, they do want to save. People aren't, um, it's not that people are stupid about this, it's just behaviourally, there's always another reason not to do it. Yeah. Automatic enrolment um, from all of the surveys um, that have been done, not just for Nest, but, but across the industry, it's incredibly popular. People are really, really glad. The sense of relief that, oh, you know, somebody's doing this for me, That's that, that is that is a weight of my mind. This is one less thing I have to worry about. The big concern in policy terms is people get anchored to the kind of statutory minimums. So the statutory minimums post-2019 um, will be 8%. And there's an active debate going on in the UK about whether 8% is enough. I think when you look to Australia, I think they're at about 12 to 13%. Um, and there's lots of debates about 8% is, is too low. But 8% is certainly a lot better than 0%, which, which is where we were before. Um, procrastination, um, there's, there's lots of behavioral evidence about this. I think the key point I'd want to make about this, though, is that um, even if you do make some good decisions about how you invest, and the story that um, my boss, the CIO, whose background is an ex-hedge fund manager, he used to be the CIO at American Express, he knows all about investing, super smart guy, he's got a first in maths from, from Cambridge. Every now and again, he goes in to his own kind of pension kind of funds and he plays around with it all and he gets his perfect portfolio and he leaves it and he goes, brilliant, that's it, that's absolutely optimal. And then he forgets about it for six months and markets change and all sorts of things happen. And then he goes back and he goes, oh, I should have done this and done that. But even though it's his job all day, every day to manage people's money, he never thinks about his own money because he's focusing on what we're doing for, for other people. So I think that's, it's a really good example of even the people who should be really, really good at this tend to be terrible when it comes to um, their own money, although they tend to get the timing wrong because, because life takes over. You have, you have a job, you have families, you have interests. The last thing you want to be doing is going home and playing around with, with a portfolio. Um, and I think um, the naive di diversification as well is, is a key point. Um, there's a great quote, I was trying to find it, so I'm going to paraphrase it and get it wrong, but it's a Markowitz quote, who is the kind of father of kind of modern portfolio theory, which is all about diversification. And then he talks about himself, and he thinks, oh, you know, if markets are, markets are, uh, are bullish, 
and, I, and I'm not invested in them, I'm going to lose out on all of this. I'll put 50% of my money in um, high returning kind of stocks. But then he thinks, oh, I'm, I'm really worried about markets crashing and I lose all my money. So I'll put 50% in kind of fixed income kind of stocks. And it's this kind of, you know, that these are the kinds of um, sort of mental accounting that people do which tend to be really, really inefficient. They're not a good way of investing. They're not um, getting anywhere close to being on the efficient frontier. Um, and I think our view kind of a nest is the people who should be doing this is our experts in the same way in medicine or in you know, car manufacturer. You'd want experts making these complicated decisions. You can make decisions about you know, which hospital you go to or, or you know, which color car and stuff. But do you really want to be the person who's designing the internal combustion engine? Um, and this is something kind of um, we've sort of t taken to, to, to heart. The other thing, there's a lot of evidence out there about people's understanding of kind of fees and charges. I think we've touched on that with one of the previous presentations. Um, and there's loads of studies out there saying even very, very sophisticated um, you know, really, really smart people struggle to kind of pick the right thing to look at when com comparing funds. Um, and here's a, I'll skip over this very, very quickly, but it's, it's just a, a study um, from, from the US that showed the more funds that, that you have available, the least efficient the portfolio construction has tended to be. So as soon as you start getting into having 30 or 40 different funds that you can choose from, people just get nowhere near uh, being efficient in terms of kind of risk adjusted return. Supply side. So in the UK, we have a very, very kind of mature, advanced um, financial services system. It's basically our entire economy. Um, <laughs> and th there, there is huge, <laughs> for the moment, <laughs> um, there's kind of huge kind of multiplicity of, of, of products. So it's not that there isn't enough choice, but I think um, what we would see um, traditionally is this idea of fund supermarkets is you've got so much choice, it's very, very um, kind of debilitating. But I'll just um, jump onto this kind of slide. Um, a study was done um, across European kind of funds about all of the different types of fund choices and where they sit on a risk spectrum. And I think what we've found in the UK is in a similar study is that you have this illusion of choice, like thousands and thousands of different fund choices. But all of them tend to just hug around about the same kind of <coughs> position on a risk spectrum. So it, it's the same funds, they're just packaged up differently or they're marketed in a different way. Um, charges in the UK have been pretty high. The thing that's brought charges down most in occupational pension schemes um, is the creation of NEST. And it's been a really, uh, it's a secondary kind of objective, but it's been a really interesting experience, I think, in the UK, that you drop a not-for-profit organization with a motive of purely acting in their members' interests. There's no kind of, you know, principal agent issues here. Um, it's amazing the behavior of all of the other market participants, that charges have come down, investment strategies have become a lot more sophisticated, the numbers of choices offered has reduced, um, just to make an example of kind of nest fund choices, so whilst we've only got five fund choices away from the default strategy, if you look at it on a kind of risk spectrum, we've pretty much covered all of the different kind of risks. So if, you were, if people were just purely looking at, um, I want to invest according to a, a different risk profile, you don't need to have 200 funds to, to get that kind of, kind of um, that, 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 that wide breadth. Um, and I think just, and I am going to now sum up, um, I think what we would say is that the, the idea of choice sounds attractive. It sounds like market forces will work and um, you'll see um, prices come down, you'll see lots of innovation. All the experience we've seen in the UK is there's been very little innovation in terms of DC um, pension funds over the last kind of 20 or 30 years. Um, charges have been extremely high. There's had to been a lot of intermediation with financial advisors. The financial advisors in the past have had some terrible conflicts of interests, which have caused kind of massive amounts of regulation to come in to stop them taking commissions for recommending things. So our argument would be that the whilst choice in lots and lots of other markets is a really, really good way of improving kind of outcomes in this market mainly because of kind of asymmetries of information and principal agent problems, um, you have some, some real, real issues. 
Um, and then I'll just, um, my kind of final slide, and this is definitely the final slide, um, <laughs> is that we believe the markets are a good thing. And we believe that um, having kind of proper players in a market improves outcomes for everybody. But to get those markets to work, you need to have people of equal standing on, on kind of both sides. So our approach kind of with the default strategy and also to a certain extent with some of the fund choices um, is that we can act as an intelligent customer on behalf of um, our membership. So we can drive innovation in the industry. We can give confidence to fund providers and asset managers um, that will have long-term relationships with them, that we're prepared to pay reasonable fees, but we're not going to get kind of ripped off. And I think that's where the focus should be in terms of trying to get markets working um, in, in DC investment. Thank you very much.